it's been a new experience this past few years and I think we've we've all seen some unexpected things and we'll go a little bit over what we've learned some things that work some things that don't work and did things stay the same or not we have an incredible panel and we've organized this in with Hoopy thank you so much for for the support and now uh, I'll ask for uh, all the speakers for a quick introduction Jonan go ahead oh Thank you for choosing me. I'm Jonan. I work in developer relations for some time now, and the pandemic was very interesting. And I live in Berlin, and I work for a company called Parity Technologies, and they build Polkadot. So I'm getting to learn how to build a developer relations team in a whole new world. It was a very interesting time. Wow, sounds cool. Luca, you want to go next? Sure. Uh, hey, everyone. My name is Luca. I am the global community lead at Camunda. Um, we are a software company focusing on process orchestration and yeah we changed quite a lot since uh COVID hit i think as all of us and i'm really excited to be on uh, in this roundtable discussion and talk to you about it thank you um richard hi i'm richard i'm responsible for the developer relations and experience team at vonage uh, we offer communications apis I actually switched jobs during the pandemic into this job. Uh, so it was a very interesting time for me all around and I'm really looking forward to today's discussion. Cool. And Alessandro? Yeah, I, hi everyone. I'm the Alessandro program manager in the developer ecosystem team at Google. So uh, I manage a program called Google Developer Groups. So a community of developers passionate about Google technologies. And similarly to Richard actually, I started in this new role uh, during the pandemic, April 2020, so uh, good fun. <laughs> Guess we'll have a lot of different experiences. This will be awesome. All right, are we all ready then? Sure. Absolutely. <laughs> let's go. So let's start a little bit with just kind of some initial thoughts and overall insights. If I would ask you what would be the, what was the top learning that you took from this time, specifically during pandemic? Um, what would it be? Richard, uh, let's start with you. Okay. The silly answer is Twitch is hard. Uh, but I think the more serious answer is that I think I kind of learned a lot about like taking care of each other as a team in difficult times. And I think that's actually been, you know, I, I started at, a, at, a, at, an, at another company into the pandemic and it was this big unknown and it was kind of scary and we didn't know what was going on. And a lot of the things we were doing, we suddenly couldn't do anymore and we didn't know how long it would last. And it was really great how we in that team kind of supported each other through that crisis. And that's been a really big learning experience for me. And I think something that's also been very helpful as I've now after changing jobs, now being responsible for for a way bigger team, I, I think that actually has been has been something that's made me a lot better at my current job, whether it's happening in a pandemic or not. A little bit of a, a growth path as well. Definitely. Um, what about you, Alessandro? Anything you you'd want to add? Yeah, like I think like uh, Google Developer Groups is an in-person uh, developer community and program. So March 2020, uh, in-person uh, in -person events are not possible anymore. So I think in these times, like this, uh, this was like a very challenging times for people on uh, different levels. But I think like uh, make the most out of challenging uh, times like this to try to innovate and be creative, experiment, and reassess also what you were doing before the status quo is like a, a big learning. Just don't don't uh, don't desperate. Like just like see the positive and try to to experiment something and invent something that you were not uh, doing before. I think this was my my learning. Cool. So now, John, and to you, this question was with a little bit of a twist. Um, what's the most surprising discovery that you made? Something you weren't. Expecting. I get the I get the hard one, huh? Everybody else just well, gets even the softball. Well, even look a so so you're not alone. Make it, yeah, um, I was a little bit surprised in the shift to online content and the success we found there. I think that the pandemic hit, and Devrel 
at the time was particularly small, right? Quite a bit smaller as, a, as an industry or a segment of the industry than it is today. And we were, we all looked up and we're like, well, I guess we'll just go back to engineering because we're probably out of jobs. Like without conferences, surely this cannot be done successfully. And it's not that we hadn't been producing content online. It was just a question of whether or not that was as effective as in-person events, right? That's how you create social bonds in most cases. And so building that and replacing that online was really difficult. I was surprised with the success that we found as an industry and with the speed at which we leveled up our ability to measure developer relations. Over the period of the pandemic, I, I think maybe five new companies started just to measure developer relations specifically. And that was both really nice to see and very surprising to me because I, I was not feeling particularly hopeful in, in like staring down a global pandemic, if you can imagine that. It was kind of a depressing time for me and the world. Yeah, that's that's cool. And I, I think you will have a bit more of an opportunity to also dwell in some, some of those later on the questions. Thank you. Um, Luca, what about you? Surprising yeah. discovery. Yeah, I can only with, uh, agree with you, Jonan. Um, and for us, I think, um, it was surprising to see at the beginning of the pandemic, everyone was really desperate to go back to in-person events. So our company, we like adapted quite quickly. We actually had a really big conference planned um, at the beginning of the pandemic. It uh, should take place in New York and then it was all canceled and we had to turn it around in basically a month. And also our community, our meetup organizers, they adapted super quickly, which was really great to see. But always when we met with them, they said, oh, we really want to go back in, uh, to in-person events. We really miss it. And now I think um, the normal has changed a little. And people are like, yeah, we really want to see you in person, but not always. So people like to stick to online formats and for me that was actually really pr surprising to see because we were really desperately waiting for going back to in-person events and I think that is also a big advantage because especially with our global community it's really nice to see that we are able to connect to all of them and that we are also able to listen to them which I think is super important. Cool thanks for sharing and that bridges a little bit maybe into the next question that, uh, that we have here. So specifically on outreach and looking at events how did the event strategy change compared to, to before the pandemic? Maybe, Luca, you can uh, build mm -hmm. on what you were saying a little bit. Sure. Um, yeah, so for us, it actually changed a lot because prior to COVID, we had mostly in-person events. And obviously, when COVID hit, we had to move everything to online events. And I think it's always about like finding out what works online and what doesn't work online. You cannot just like translate everything that you do in person to an online event. So we tried out a lot of uh, different things. And for us, it was really great to see that we were able to really reach our global uh, community. Because I think before we were missing a lot of opportunities, for example, to reach people in India or Brazil. And then at some point we were actually able to attend the events and to also engage and uh, listen to their feedback. So now um, we have, I think, more events because it's easier to set them up and less resources are needed and we make them more specific for each specific target group. But um, also we moved some of our events to a hybrid um, event. So for example, our annual user conference, we moved that to a hybrid setup and this worked really well. It just uh, took place actually now in October. So <laughs> just recently. Nice. Anyone else wants to, to answer to this question? Maybe I'll jump in. I think I relate to what Luca said. Uh, I think like what I've seen, at least in our communities, is that there was like an evolution in the past three years. Mm -hmm. So before the pandemic, uh, we had like in-person only events in our community and they were mainly local. Uh, while during the pandemic, of course, like some people got very excited about about experimenting with, with digital, digital events. So of course, we had online events only, but like people came together in a, in a region to host to host regional events or national events. Some of them had like big focus, like worldwide focus and were quite successful. While now in this phase, I think we see like a, a mix of in-person 
and online events. I think people are keen, more and more keen to go back to in-person events, but they have more of a local focus. So I'm really happy that we can retain the online uh, dimension. But like we, I think what, what I see is that we're, we're coming back to a local focus. Yeah. I think the hybrid of, oh, I'm sorry. Go for it. Um, I think the hybrid approach leveled up significantly because we were forced to, right? Suddenly there were a whole lot of Devro people on earth and many community members who were real super lonely for their friends, right? Mm -hmm. We missed all of our friends from these conference hallways and we tried to replicate those things online. And that was real hard in the beginning. I'm sure that um, many of you remember Deserted Island DevOps, the conference that they ran online where they ran it in Animal Crossing. They had people presenting and running around the island at the time Animal Crossing was just becoming this very popular game. And it was a smashing success. And I remember thinking when I saw that conference that maybe this could work out. Maybe we could do this thing only online. But building engagement strategies for virtual environments is just a thing that had never been a priority for developer relations because we had the low-hanging fruit of in-person events, right? We, we were already hitting it out of the park as compared to like a lot of companies that didn't really know what they were doing in the space. They would run these events and they're like, now what you're going to do is sign up for 10 hours of me talking at you about our product. Are you ready for the infomercial? Right. And we're like, how about we have a board game night where developers could actually talk to each other or whatever else we did in person. And that was a big win. And then that was all gone. And so we had to find a way to do that on online and using platforms that kind of combine spatial audio and virtual spaces and, uh, you know, experimenting with things like Twitch, which is brilliant, by the way, and now everyone's doing Twitch. That brought us to a place now where we don't have streaming as an option for a conference. If you're putting on a physical event and you're really only running that in person, you're like, let's just go ahead and treat this as disposable. And that doesn't seem as wise a choice anymore because of what we experienced in the pandemic. So a little bit also on being able to reuse content and making it reach yeah. more people. So how do you exactly. feel about, about the hybrid models? Is it a, a must do? I think so. I think, yeah, I mean, the drawbacks are it's tremendously difficult to achieve. And it can be very expensive if you're hiring third party, venue, party vendors to do it, right? If you're, it's a really good gig to get into right now. If you're into video production and you want to make $50,000 a day, mm -hmm. Go offer to live stream some conferences. It's very expensive and community organized events have a hard time making it real. Mm -hmm. um, and that's frustrating to me because that means that the corporations, again, have an advantage in this field. And really, we should be about the people, right? Mm -hmm. That's what DevRel is for. We fight for the users. So yeah. um, I think, yeah, like streaming is no longer as optional as people considered it to be. Mm -hmm. And certainly not the recording, at least at a bare minimum of the talks. Yeah. Yeah, I can only agree. And I think um, uh, I personally think a hybrid setup works really well for us. It worked really, really well. Um, but also you have to be really intentional about it and you really have to realize that it's basically two separate events. So I think if you have an in-person uh, setting, then usually or sometimes it can happen that you treat it like, OK, you have the in-person experience and then. Yeah, the other one is just an add on. But I th then I think people will feel left out who are. Uh, attending virtually. So I really think that you have to treat it as two separate events to create like a high class experience. So for example, at our uh, conference, we um, had moderation uh, in, during the breaks and then they um, did like um, behind the scenes insights and things like that. So that worked really well and then people felt really included. But I think, yeah, as you said, John, and I think it's really about realizing that there's more work and that you have two separate experiences if you really want to do it well. That's a cool example, the behind the scenes to bring the people mm -hmm. that are remote. That, that's actually pretty cool. Um, what about you? It's Richard? brilliant. Any... You're finding ways to add value instead of to like, <laughs> treat this as a lesser experience, right? This yeah, is exactly what this sure. should be. And it, it allows us to include a whole sphere of people who couldn't go to physical conferences in the first place mm -hmm. otherwise. And we're entirely left behind. And now they get a whole new and better experience in some mm -hmm. ways, right? Make yeah. this not like a, an afterthought and an add-on and like, oh, I guess we'll stream also. Mm -hmm. But this is a whole unique event in addition to this one, right? Conference plus plus. Yeah. And I think what I... What I find really nice about it is that it's not a fluffed up type of content, but actually sharing something about what's going on in the background. And I think we all know with, with developers, fluff doesn't work. So 
that's that's a pretty nice idea. <laughs> Richard, um, any thoughts on hybrid? What's been your experience so far? Yeah, I think there were some there were some pretty good thoughts here, right? I think in the beginning of the pandemic, we kind of went like, okay, we've done conferences in person. How do we take this exact thing and do it online? And I think many of us had the experience of sitting at like an online booth all day with absolutely nobody showing up, right? I, I remember doing, I don't know, I think it might have been um, reInvent even, like not exactly a small event where you'd think there would be some people there and me sitting an entire day at our virtual booth staring at like an empty browser window, desperately hoping for someone, anyone to show up and say hi. And it, it just didn't happen. It was like a five hour booth shift where I just did nothing. And so I think we really had to learn to kind of figure out what are the things we just can't replicate online, right? For me, going to a physical event, like the hallway track, and just the, the people sometimes look at sort of the, the travel aspect where you have to go to a different place, maybe even get on a plane, going to events sort of as a, a downside or a defect. But for me, it's always been a feature, right? Because it allows you to get out of your day to day. You're not in the office anymore, be it a real or a home office, right? And you, you can clear your head and you're in a different environment and it makes you much more receptive to those new ideas that you're going to be presented with. Whereas if you're doing a virtual event, an online event, you spend half your day staring at people talking to you through a screen anyway these days. How is that different? How is that special? And I think those are some of, some of the things Luca talked about. It's really great that we can expand the reach of events that we're doing if we're doing them hybrid and get some of the content and make it accessible to more people. But we also got to understand it's not the same thing as being there in person and then figuring out how do you provide value to people who come to it because in, in many ways what's the difference me showing up to that event and seeing it live versus checking out the content three weeks later on youtube and if there's little to no difference you're probably not doing it right that's a very this good is point. the same reason why the hallway track has always been like our preferred method of engagement right we all go to these conferences and we're like wow the videos are all recorded so i can watch them later and then you mostly don't Right. Mm -hmm. But you end up building engagement and relationships in the hallway that do more value, like present more value to you and your team in the end. Anyway, building these these new things online and as Luke was saying, building this like additive value, I think, has trained us all to think very deeply about how to make these things, you know, fluff free, intensely engaging events. I mean, nobody wants to sit there and just watch lectures at home. It's, it's strictly speaking a worse than worst conference to go and sit there and just watch the pre-presented slides go, you wanna be part of the conversation, I wanna participate, I want that choose your own adventure style television relationship that the platforms like Twitch can give me, you know? That's what's so amazing about that. So we shared some ideas on what to, what to do from an organizing an event point of view that you can do online. What about if you come in as a, as a sponsor and you get, um, like Richard was saying, for example, you get to be at a virtual booth. What are some ideas uh, of what can be done? How do you, you have a fixed time, you're not fully in control, any experiences Don't. or things that worked? <laughs> Don't. I mean, I've I not been. Yeah. yeah. I was thinking of reInvent as an example. Like, I was going to say, oh, it's great that they gave us such a massive discount. They really didn't. Mm -hmm. They gave you the same, like, closet rental mm -hmm. prices for half of your company's budget. Mm -hmm. and no value. I think we saw eight people that day and seven mm -hmm. of them were like, where do I get the free t-shirt? And that was it. Mm -hmm. It's really not worth it because if you don't have control over the platform then you don't have a control over the attendee experience. Mm -hmm. And that's the real value in having a booth. You can control the attendee experience. You can set up your booth to be like, we're handing out pens and here is a bad USB charger that's 1.2 amps, right? Like, or you, you can actually like create a welcoming space where people can come and hang out. You could just be the hangout zone. I'm not gonna give you all my booth secrets right now, <laughs> right? But you can, you can craft that experience. And online, you don't have 
the ability to craft that experience at all. So in most cases, I, I would be really hesitant to sponsor an online only event, unless it's like your people, right? You want to show up for your community and support them in their efforts. If someone from our community, one of our ambassadors comes to us and is like, hey, we're going to run this polka dot event. We'd love it if we could get a little bit of funding. I'm like, absolutely. Like you do you, we will do our best to help you make that successful. But beyond that, I have yet to see the, a really valuable sponsorship, except for, um, honestly, Deserted Island DevOps. They killed it. And, and all you got to do is just copy them perfectly. Good luck. <laughs> that's, a, that's, that's a fair point. And things don't always need to work out, right? We all also need to know when things don't work and, and when, not to, when to say no. And then a question on, we're talking about outreach, events. What about budgets? We don't need to mention any, any actual numbers, but have you felt, uh, have you noticed the change in, for example, the, the budgets that DevRel was able to, to get before versus now? Alessandro, maybe we can uh, start with you. Yeah, I think like during the pandemic, the, the budget definitely was, was cut. Uh, but at the same time, since we were heavily focused on in-person events and we couldn't do in-person events anymore, of course, like the costs that we had were also uh, much less. So I would say, uh, like now, probably the the budget is not is not yet at the uh, the same level as it was pre pandemic, but like is getting is getting closer. Yeah, that's the like from our our point of view. Maybe something uh, to add. I think the pandemic really showed the value of community and also developer relations. So I feel in the industry. Obviously, it's re it really depends on the company, but um, also companies really see start seeing the value. There are a lot of several teams actually that were built during the pandemic or a community team. So I think a lot of companies um, yeah, start seeing the value and also invest in it and put budget into it. Yeah, at our company, I mean, we at Camuna, we didn't really have issues in getting the budget for DevRel, but obviously the spend um is different like it's spent on not on in-person events anymore on, on traveling um so obviously it's spent differently but i also think in general regarding the industry that companies start seeing the value more and i i, I think just to some degree the, the the challenge wasn't so much getting the budget but figuring out how do you spend it now and how do you spend it in a way that if you spend the money you can still justify that you did it because you asked for the money you had a plan well you said well doing these events and these are this is the roi and this is thing we're getting and you know you do your first one or two online events and you realize oh yeah a lot of this was predicated on the booth and there is no booth we paid for a booth but there is no booth uh what do we do now and how do we get value for the money that we we do spend and I think as with everything, you were kind of looking for creative, innovative ways to do things, yes, but also how to spend the, 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 the money that you had. I think um, from my perspective, I absolutely agree with you. I, I think this is an excellent point, but I think that the, the money has come post pandemic. Like I, I feel like it's a lot easier for us and I mostly work with small companies or smallish companies as compared to you that like, um, you know, Vonage and Google are a, a much bigger like budget machine, right? Than I'm usually working with. I'm helping smaller companies, 500 people build the DevRel team and get started in that space. And the, the power of a network effect in like both this hybrid world and post pandemic I think it's, it, it's unlocked this ability to one like hire and to get the budget provided that you're using that money intelligently, right? And I'm not gonna be signing us up to go to reInvent, right? Like this is a, sorry, Amazon friends, that is a colossal waste of money in my, my not very humble opinion. You, you have an opportunity for that to sponsor, you know, every single meetup for every single group of community members who is even vaguely interested in your technology globally for the entire year. And you will instead choose to stand in a closet and hand out pencils. That's ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. If you're showing up for your community and you're spending the money wisely and you can demonstrate the value and you're measuring it carefully, I think that the, the budget is there. And I've watched developer relations as a practice quintuple in popularity easily. 
since the pandemic hit, which was not at all what I was expecting. I was like, we're done. Game over. Maybe I'll go be a beet farmer. And suddenly this industry has exploded and you see a lot of people going through a lot of the things that Deborah already argued about over the years again in public. And it's, it's just like this explosion of interest coming from people who suddenly realize the value that they can get from these programs. And that has unlocked a lot of the money. I think it also shifted a lot of the budget from traditional marketing events. They're like, well, we, we've got to cancel our, um, our conference that we were going to put on for our four and a half million dollars. Uh, how are you going to, you know, find ways to spend that money? And, Deverell is not always the first choice in that case because mm -hmm. those budgets are typically controlled by like marketing teams and they think we're just kind of wacko sometimes, right? Mm -hmm. But um, if you can get a little piece, you can do a lot with a little. So I've, I've been pretty impressed actually with what people have been able to achieve given what they've had to work with and with companies finally, like really smart companies coming to realize what they can get out of that money instead of putting it into these almost like software rituals that we were just in this habit of doing every year. Just go back to the thing, spend the money. That's what it costs for the big party over and over and over. It shook things up and that's a good thing for the industry. So focus on where you actually get a return for what you're yeah. spending and the not necessarily big name events, but the events where the people that you care about are. Yeah, I feel like we're bullying reInvent. ReInvent, you're great. <laughs> we love you, man. Just you do you. Yeah, <laughs> no harm meant. One last question on events. So we've been talking from our point of view, DevRel, but what about from the developers, from the attendees' point of view? Have you felt uh, any impact or any change that we saw during pandemic and then after? Are people eager to go back to events um, or they're more used to the, to the online and kind of want to keep that? Is it a, what kind of split is it? Sorry, a lot of questions into one. <laughs> My start. So I think like during this time, attendees got more used to consuming uh, content online. So and when they attend an event, an in-person event, they expect completely new, higher quality content. But on top of that is also more interaction, more engagement, better networking opportunities. Otherwise, as we uh, as we already mentioned before, they can just watch like the the video later on Twitch or YouTube. So I think like the expectations now on the experience that people can get at the event is much much higher. Like if I travel to an event, of course uh, before uh, pizza was enough, uh, but now people want to have like a better better quality, better use of their time. And this comes to, I think, the, the content and it comes to the, the connection that they can make. Yeah, I, I think people have kind of realized why they went to in-person events in the first place. I think if you'd asked people pre-pandemic, why do you go to a conference? They would have said, well, because of the interesting talks. And now they've been getting all the interesting talks online uh, through, a, through a screen. They've realized maybe that wasn't the core cool thing. Maybe that wasn't really the reason I was excited about it. It was part of it, but there were a lot of other things there too. And I think this is, you're absolutely right. That has, that expectations have risen both in terms of the other parts of the conference, but also of the content because people have started consuming more content online. They might have a stronger opinion. What accounts to a good talk, amounts to a good talk or not. And I've, I've definitely had people at our booths being much more opinionated on whether this conference had good talks or not, and also be much more excited about actually interacting with, which is great for us, interacting with us at booths too, because they realize that's a big part of it. In the past, they might have walked past the booth and maybe picked up a t-shirt and be a little bit jaded and, and move on. But I find it's it's now actually easier to talk to people and to have in-depth discussions because they're, that's a part they're excited about now too. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, I think um, there is a trend of the the content and that people now realize. And and like we've uh, we've also mentioned earlier, there's people that used to go for the for the conversations and then later on uh, consume the content. And I think that's becoming more more noticeable. I think you're going to see a lot more events that almost don't have talks. 
And I know that that sounds like kind of a bonkers idea, but the point is to get the people together. Just let the people get together and be together, right? What if, what if you go and design your event such that you're enabling community and that engagement the entire time? I also wanted to mention, mention that, that we are kind of skipping over some other massive spheres of developer relations work generally and like the code and the content. Like I talk about the three C's very often of like code content and community is just like general categories of defining these things, right? Like we're real heavy into the community sphere, but it's definitely changed the attendee experience or like the participant experience mm -hmm. for content and code as well, right? Like in, in online content, I'm seeing a lot more resources being developed, but not a lot of like um, sorting function where you have like very clearly defined content journeys that follow along developer journeys, right? We've got someone who started out as a .NET person and then they ended up over here hacking on Jonan script and wasn't that great. Yay, Jonan script for the wind, right? Well, we don't, we don't actually know how they came along that journey. We aren't measuring very effectively what brought them place to place. Like some of these like journey tracking um, metrics platforms for developer relations are really useful in sewing those two things together. And I think in an effort to go wide, we kind of lost our focus a little bit in the content sphere. And I, I think people are coming back around and becoming aware of that now, and that's gonna end up with a better experience for our communities. But in the meantime, I hear more people from the community being like, well, there is, there is kind of a lot of stuff out there, but I just don't know where to find the thing I'm looking for, right? The internet is really pretty polluted these days, right? Anyone who's gone to a search engine recently recognizes First 15, sorry, Google, but like those first 15, 15 pages are like, oh, you've clearly hacked the algorithm to get your garbage to the top. And I can't find the answers to my actual questions. When you have your, your, you end up kind of competing against all of the content resources in your community and the stuff that people are generating. And in some cases, that's pretty low quality as compared to what you could offer. So organizing things carefully and measuring it effectively and, and making sure that you're, you're building up alongside those developer journeys to bring people along thing is even more important now and I, I hope to be hearing better things from community members in the near future that it's that it's easier to learn instead of harder I would mm -hmm. like that world better I think it's also uh, a field that we can or a part that we can continuously improve on and it's also in our interest to to do that um, that's yeah. a good point on 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 content and learning and enablement we'll we'll get to it soon um, <laughs> One question uh, still before, just more on, so we're talking about big events and more conferences. What about smaller community nurture events? How, how has it evolved? Are, are the same activities still working? So for us, we definitely did more community engagement events, I would say, or community nurturing events uh, when the pandemic hit. Of course, First, because it's easier to set up these kind of events online, but I think more importantly, it's really about psychological safety when the, a crisis hits. And for us, it was really important like to nurture our community members to really listen to what they have to say, to be really transparent with them, to kind of over communicate things that are happening because we knew there are so many things going on and so many people are really worried that we, yeah, just, offered more for our community members, especially with our um, highly engaged community members. So we met with them more often um, and communicated just more. And I think this is definitely something um, that we started doing and that we will continue doing because it works well and people like it. Um, and of course, maybe at some point that will change, but I think like being really transparent about um, what is going on within the company is super important. That's interesting. So something new that you started and that you will keep on on doing. Any other experience on on this? I got distracted by some really good points that were just made, um, and I want to hear your original question again because I definitely had thoughts, but that was really well said. <laughs> I agree with you one hundred percent. So the original question was for community nurture events. What has changed? What did we we do? Are we still doing the same activities? I think that I actually, um, I, I don't know that I have identified a trend here, but I'm certainly thinking about it a little bit differently when I'm building these things out. But I guess there's a, there's a simple thing that I've, I've had to explain to people less what a champion champions program is or an ambassador's program. I think people, people get that. They're often, often it's like, this is the program and they're like over here, but like they're shooting for it and that's good, right? 
they understand that like this is a thing that's important and like finding your champions in your community and turning them into ambassadors for your your work that's an important thing but then in how you build that out i think i've been thinking a lot more about like roi i guess maybe um which is a gross way to think about community from my perspective like how, how do we squeeze the quarters out of these these machines instead of like genuinely adding value to the community in the first place which is what we should be doing in devrel um and but 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 i think like more just like bang for the buck like how do i get the most value for my community out of this budget and these type of events and i think that very often we're discovering that the people are, are like clamoring at the gates to help you they're waiting to run the me up they're looking for the 300 dollars for pizza and beer it's just a complicated process to get them 300 dollars. like it's far easier to go to a massive conference and spend a hundred thousand dollars sponsoring a booth than it is to like send three hundred dollars to argentina for someone to buy some beer and pizza for their meetup why is that that's that that should be a thing that we can just do right I'm, i've been thinking about like how to smooth that process out because i think there's a lot of value being lost in that whole process that's that's true any any thoughts to to add to this one before we we move Alessandro, Maybe. richard yeah. yeah, maybe just sharing like uh, our experience. So we are, so we, we go back to in person. We wanted to meet our uh, community leads on the ground. So we are hosting like uh, a few summits all around Europe, the, the region that I uh, am managing uh, to meet our community organizers. And before we were hosting these, uh, these summits with a lot of talks, a lot of, you know, content and learning opportunity, let's say, to share best practices across uh, organizers uh, but they were like like most of the time before were like like a one-way direction uh, like talks with like some uh, some question and answer at the end now we are focusing 90 percent of our content on discussion and engagement so when our community organizers come together they we want them just to talk and to connect and to share their best practices but not in a you know one-way direction but they can like cross uh, pollinate, contaminate with their with their best practices. So this is like what we we change like a lot. So no more no more one way content. But let's just like have a discussion. Let's meet. Uh, let's make people meet and connect. It's a fair point. Let's then move on to to content that we've started to go go for it. We had a Sorry. we had a question. I think from the discord that is a really uh, good question and i really want to answer and if you're not trying to pause right now then i'm just gonna ignore it but i'm excited to talk about it uh, maybe maybe we can do it. questions at the end oh we're waiting for the end i'm sorry i forgot that I was the plan okay. i'm a little bit flighty all right keep going I'll, I'll that's okay questions. though if you if you already have okay. the answer for it then you want to go for it well no because it relates to content exactly this thing maybe, maybe you'll get let me get away with just one quick one so someone from the okay. chat asked like how do i choose between making individual contributions and like uh, uh, like how do i choose between leveling myself up and focusing on helping the community those are the same thing those are the same thing do it at the same time learn in public this is the really hard part of starting out in developer relations but you got to let go of the idea that you should have already known the answers to everything Right. I work really hard with my children who come to be sobbing when they're three years old and can't like draw a perfect 3D model of a horse. And, and I'm like, look, nobody was born with the ability to do that. Like, what is wrong with you? You have very high expectations for yourself. And I appreciate that. But let it go. Get out there in public and be wrong a lot. Like start a Twitch stream, turn it on and then go and study go like be like, wow, this is really interesting. This part is hard. This part is easy. And you're not only generating content that is informing the people who create those tools. Right, because they, they they get like a live A/B test, just hours and hours of it, and that's awesome. But you're also helping other people feel that like welcome of knowing that they're not alone in their struggle. Right, that this is hard. Software is hard, and there are some people who pretend that it's easy, and those are not people I tend to trust very much. So get out there and fail publicly, and learn publicly, and you can build the content as you're learning your whole journey. And otherwise you trap yourself in this place where you're like, well, I got to make sure that this resource is perfect before I put it out there for the community to add value. One of the, my favorite blogs ever, if you read back, they're terrible in the beginning. I'm like, wow, that was a really bad idea. But I remember when software collectively had that really bad idea all at the same time. And now we move progress forward. I think like creating content as you learn is the 
best way to get started in developer relations. Be really loud a lot. I think that's really good advice. And um, I think one thing within the, the DevRel industry is that we're all not afraid to fail and just happy to try and support each other through it and very aware that we're all humans. Probably the reason why we like to interact with fellow humans. Um, but I think that that's really good advice, gentlemen. So without bridge, let's, um, what about content? Um, and more on the topic of developer enablement and learning. Um, so we had more time also to focus on the um, online journeys. Do you, have you changed your approach uh, to developer enablement strategies? Is I mean, one of the, um, oh. Go for it. Go. Thank you. Uh, I think one of the, the important lessons from the pandemic too was that foundational work matter often matters more than some of the glitzier parts of our job right i went from doing a hundred thousand airline miles a, a year and being in you know mumbai one week and in seattle the next and in sao paulo the, the next to not doing that anymore and kind of having to look at okay how do i invest my time now and you know, building a great developer experience, focusing on your developer experience as a product and spending your time there. And then putting really good content on top that is really helpful to people is ultimately something you need to do, even if you have the, the, the glitzy event strategy, right? The events are really valuable. I love doing events. I'm super happy we get back to it again. They're an important part of our strategy. But ultimately, the purpose of those is to drive people towards your developer experience, to, towards the other, towards the foundational things that you're offering. And if they're not good, you're almost, why are you doing the other stuff, right? And so I think that's that kind of, at the time, helped me refocus a little bit on fundamentals and, and say, you know, okay, what are the maybe less glamorous things, but that are really, really helpful to anyone who comes to us now and tries to tries to use us and tries to build with us. How do I enable them to succeed by themselves, even if maybe I can't go out to them anymore and talk to them directly and help them directly? How do I build the tools? How do I give them the ability to help themselves succeed with the technology that I'm representing? I think... Uh... An interesting question on that, and um, is how to how do you decide how to build that journey or how that journey should look like? I mean, that's that's now a really deep question about developer experience. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe uh, maybe that's a that's a whole nother roundtable <laughs> discussion. But I I think the, the 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 core thing is to look at it always through the eyes of your developer, right? With that developer empathy, there's a there's a there's always that that inertia that drive to start shipping your org chart right there's one team and another team and that team that builds that website and that team builds that website and they don't work together and then you have two websites and a developer comes in and is like which one do i use where do i start right and and it, i think that is a constant struggle like it's very easy to say oh you know we have empathy for developers we love that word and develop relations but is a is a constant struggle to take that step back and ask yourself, okay, why are we doing this? Are we doing this for us? You know, are we, is our is our goal in building this thing because we are looking for an outcome for us, or are we building it for an outcome for our developers, which then generates the outcome uh, for us? And I think it can sometimes be easy for us in DevRel, you know, to with some of the of the glitzier parts of our job to kind of forget about that. And we need to constantly remind ourselves that that is something we need to do and focus on. And I think to some degree, the pandemic had been, certainly for me, has been helpful in that because it kind of forced me to do that, which was, I think, good and healthy. I think you've made some excellent points. This is actually, before we go, I, I have some thoughts about the developer experience piece. But I'm looking for a glitzy DevRel job. If anyone has a DevRel job where like the travel is actually glamorous and fun instead of just like soul sucking and grueling and horrible, I would like to sign up for that. But the um, the part about developer experience that you just 
kind of shifted thinking for me is I, I use this like boat metaphor a lot. I don't know, I'm into boats. Uh, like, but like that you're trying to build the boat and you want to make sure that the boat is nice when people get on there. Like you build the boat first, you got to get together like your content channels and your stage. And then you start putting people from your community on that stage. But if you're getting all these community members onto the stage and it's a terrible boat to be on, and it's leaky and filled with rats, then like no one's going to want to hang out on the boat, right? I mean, you kind of shifted my thinking in what you were saying there. And that if you focus first on, on making a really solid developer experience with the resources that you have available, then you set your future programs that you build on top of that up for success, right? So maybe it is worth front loading some of the investment and redesigning that docs page that is really confusing or like getting rid of the, the five or 10 different entry points. Right? I always tell people to like find someone who really doesn't know your product at all and make them try and figure out how to do a thing with your website, like old school AB testing where we used to watch the videos of people trying to use our stuff and be like, just click the button. It's right there. It's the only button. It's the only button on the page. Just click it. Like doing that with yourselves and your community can be really valuable in understanding how rough those edges are because we all come to know our, our products and our spheres really well, right? We know our ecosystem really well. And so like you just become blind to that automatically and it's really unfortunate how quickly we move past that and come up with all these intricate strategies like maybe if we give away branded fireworks and it said the company name in the sky right like just make the docs good man make the docs really good and make the there is really there is there is a sort of a, a pandemic downside to this too which is that you know i used to do a lot of hackathons in the before times which by the way is one of those things that doesn't seem to have come back quite as much as as it existed before I mean, you can kind of see maybe why it's almost the ideal pandemic breeding ground situation. So I'm, I'm maybe not all that unhappy that there's been some hesitancy around it. But it used to be, you know, of course, part of the reason we're doing it is to get the brand out there and to get people signed up and to get people to use the APIs and, and meet people. But it was it was also for me always super interesting to be kind of sneak up on developers and look over their shoulders as they went through that first journey. And it was that, why aren't you clicking the button? Click the button and you realize, okay, I better get out the notebook, note, notebook and make some notes here. I'm going to go go back and improve that. And when, when people come to you at two o'clock in the night, bleary eyed and slightly mad that it doesn't work, you'll get very direct feedback that you can work back into your developer experience. And that was something that during the pandemic was cut off a little bit. And that was something I definitely noticed is that, you know, I wanted to invest time in those other things, but it's hard for yourself when you're so familiar with your own technology and your own portal and your own documentations to see where those rough edges are. The hackathons are interesting because they're still super popular in our space, right? Like I operate in a Web3 world where like that is the thing. That is the thing that people do is hackathons. And I saw a lot of pushback in developer communities uh, before against hackathons as like kind of exploitative. Like, oh, cool. Salesforce is going to trade me some pizza for several hundred thousand dollars worth of free engineering work over the weekend, right? And then like we came to a place where you know, companies, uh, it sounds like the people you were working with had the right idea, understood that this was like a give and a take. That like, we're adding value to their lives first and then the value will come back around, right? Like the give a penny, take a penny jar doesn't work if you're just like always eating the pennies, right? <laughs> you gotta like share, share the pennies with everybody. Um, it's very interesting to watch over here. There's like this explosion of activity around hackathons, but in the end, they tend to be kind of like reform and i feel like there's a lot of waste not in like the sense of like we're wasting the money but a lot of like wasted value there's like all of these artifacts like these live ab tests and these notes in the notebook that are just kind of being tossed away to the side in the it's kind of a messy process of building these programs out maybe hackathons will come back around well masked hackathons and um I think hackathons is, is an interesting example, but a little bit more on the on the, the developer and enablement, and if something has has changed. Um, just wanted to know if Alessandro or Luca have something to to add to it. So, in terms of developer enablement enablement st strategies, I would say so. We work on a one to few to many models. So we work with community leads or so ambassadors, and what we uh, what we are trying to provide them with at the moment is like uh, 
type of content like we, we changed our approach and we we don't give them any more like content that is just uh that they can just use in person but we are also set, like providing them with content that can be used like both in person and online so uh, if they want to host an event an event like a, a normal meetup with pizza and beer they can do it if they want to do it hybrid uh, they can also do it and if they want to do it also like online uh, it wouldn't be like out of out of the world so in a, in our case that's that's what we what we change and we also switched a bit to like content that is a bit more hands on so that you go from zero zero to one uh, let's say at least or any way they can make pro uh, progress people i think like in uh, like coming back to like just quickly to hackathons probably with mature technologies hackathons are not working anymore that's why maybe we web3 like uh, where maybe we don't have like uh, content online that people can use to learn like hackathons are probably a thing but like in uh, in other sectors where there are already you know uh, repositories on github there is like lots of videos online uh, people don't see the value to go to a hackathon. It's better if, like, I I read online rather than using like a couple of a couple of days to uh, to go to a hackathon. So that that's a bit my my experience in this. Yeah, I can only agree with a lot of things that have been said. I thought it's um, really interesting what Richard uh, said uh, that we don't really get the instant feedback from people. So I think it's even more important that we make community members independent of us and really, as Richard said, doing uh, this foundation foundational work. <laughs> and um, yeah, so I think developer enablement is more important than ever. Yeah. Thank you. I think uh, on this topic, we, we've managed to to go through a bit of different spaces and, and those are some really cool insights. So to wrap up, uh, let's look a little bit at the, let's go back to looking at the DevRel uh, teams and how pandemic affected. And I mean, DevRel, like we've been saying, people used to fly all the time, be on one place, go to one place, to an event, and then all of a sudden that's gone. My question is, how did this impact the teams and how is the getting back to normal now looking like? I think it's uh, actually really closely related to what we just uh, talked about. Um, at the beginning, especially our developer advocacy team, they were already sad that they weren't able to travel anymore because obviously these are the kind of things they enjoy most. But then also we realized, okay, how much time there is for doing this foundational work, what we just talked about. Um, so I think that was actually a real advantage of uh, not being able to travel anymore. And now it's nice to see that we are going back to in-person events and um, to traveling, but we are way more intentional about it. And I think this back to normal, I think we will never really get back to the normal we knew prior to pandemic, but I think that's actually a really good thing because I think a lot of things have changed in a really good way. So I wouldn't like us to get back to this normal prior to the pandemic, but that we really take the learnings and yeah, continue with what works well. I, I think to some degree, maybe we even had an advantage in DevRel going into the pandemic because most of our teams were already remote or remote-ish and very well distributed. Like my old team went from Bangalore to Seattle and then I joined a company with a team from Singapore to Seattle. And ultimately, a lot of the things that many people struggled with and had to learn and working from home and working you know, with, with other people not being able to just go into a meet in person meeting immediately and all those things we were already used to a little bit. And so I think some of the changes we had to go through, like, oh, we can no longer travel and those things were probably actually smaller changes for us than for other people who are used to going into the office, sitting across from their colleagues and now had to adapt to this world where they were working from home, working remotely. Uh, and and so I, I I think it can be easy to forget that we to, to some degree actually might have had it easier than many other people at least in in terms of the way we worked with our teams and interacted with our teams. You stole my point a little bit because I was going to talk about that. Like 
the number of arguments I've had with people at conferences about how like remote would never work. There's just no way you can build an in-office culture or a, a culture for a company without in-office, like maybe 15%. And if I'm optimistic of the companies in the Valley were like willing to be fully remote or like majority remote. I think maybe back in the day and now it's just kind of silly to suggest like we make fun of those people on Twitter who are like, well, you got to come to the office. Well, you got to come to the office. And then we go off and like join other software companies. Right. Because I think you're right. Absolutely right. We had a huge advantage. I was actually beginning to talk about the metrics part. I think what I've seen most come out of the pandemic is a focus on measurement. And that was the thing that was really hard for people for a really long time. There were a couple of DevRel cons in a row that were just like all metrics presentations um, and rightly so right like for a long time we got away with demonstrating the value because when companies drop their DevRel team you watch their product growth flatline and then they would rehire those same six people and then it would spike back up again you'd be like okay we finally have the evidence can you shush already and let us go do our stuff you know and now we had to focus on those developer journeys the the content tracking platforms i was like to do shout out to crunch i have to shout out crunch for building this thing that is exactly what i wanted which was like they went from this blog post and then they went to this GitHub repo and then they went to this thing and then they were at this conference. You are able to map the whole thing and talking a little bit about like the Web3 world when people are interacting with public blockchains and the kind of like community data you can get from people and like what they're interested in from that sort of information in a very healthy and anonymous way. It's really refreshing to work in that space. But like being able to, to see the measurement and the content strategy really level up, I think we had to, to shift our game up a little bit we did have some advantages, but I'm pleased to be having fewer conversations about like, what even is developer relations? And, and like, w why do you need to talk about developer journeys? Like they'll figure it out. Why do we need a champions program or an ambassador program? Now I think people suddenly realize that this is an important thing for their company and it is a unique sphere of expertise. It's not like engineers who like blogging, engineers with communication skills anymore. We're not having that conversation as much. And I'm really happy to, to be moving past that as an industry and kind of like pushing ourselves to the next level. Yeah, maybe um, just to close, I think I think the nor normal is not there anymore. Uh, uh, so we and normal is not going to come back. So definitely, we what we need to do is just like getting all the learning that we had in the in the past couple of years and merging them with our our previous knowledge. And I think. Uh, I think, as everyone said, like in a, in this group, like there there is a lot a lot of improvements compared uh, to to pre pandemic. If you see the acceleration of this improvement, like some of these changes will have taken like probably decades to go in action. Like from attendees being more uh, or um, community members being more uh, keen to uh, to get to online uh, online events or uh, online online content to remote teams. I think like the, the acceleration that we had in this couple of years in, in our sector is incredible and we should just like get the most out of it. Be less travel, uh, maybe is also, it's also good for our mental health. <laughs> Y'all are real smart. Thanks for coming along. Like I do, I like hanging out with you. We should do this in person someday. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds good. And that's pretty much the questions we had. Uh, I guess my, my last question is is there anything else you'd like to to add to the audience? Uh, what to do? What uh, some words of encouragement for everyone that's trying to figure out how to reach all the developers? I think that uh, something that is most important to me, I think, always when it comes to community building, to developer relations, is really listening to your community because they know best what they need, and I think every community is so different. So really reaching out to your community members, connecting to them one-on-one -on -one and really finding out what their needs are and then adjusting to them, I think is super important. Maybe to add on that, focus on like giving value to our, to your community, community members. So like if you provide values, people, people will come, people will use your, your technology. I, I think a super interesting thing that like, kind of, came out of this whole discussion for me is that sense of like 
the pandemic accelerating the maturation of DevRel as a practice. We've talked about things like focusing on foundations and and measuring the return on investment that you do and, and refocusing on like you two just said, like how do I add value versus me going on stage and talking at people? And I think I'm I'm really excited to see that across our our whole industry. And I and I think that's a that's a really good attitude to have uh, if if you want to succeed in DevRel now is to not look at sort of the the sort of glamorous picture of what a developer advocate was pre pandemic, but but take a broader approach to you know how can we help our developers succeed with what we're what we're offering. Again, with the glamour, I I just I've never felt so. <laughs> like I was missing out. I need more glamour in my life. Um, I think the the point that you all are making about like pushing ourselves forward is is really important. I think to encourage people who are coming after us, uh, if I had advice, like starting out would be to just kind of be fearless in the things that you try. Developer relations as a practice got to the place it is with experimentation, right? With people like sharing their learnings as they came along listen very closely to your community experiment with your implementation of your potential programs be fearless with those experiments and ideally build them in ways that they can be conducted inexpensively right like conduct a finite number of discrete experiments and iterate quickly and you'll find your way to your community a lot of people ask me like what should i talk about when they're getting started and i'm like you talk about the stuff that you're into because you're naturally going to draw the audience towards you that is interested in the things that you are interested in. If you're just starting out in developer relations, you're trying to become a content creator online, get out there and just talk about the things that you personally find interesting. Odds are very, very good. There are a huge number of developers in the world who also find those things interesting. And you're going to find your people, right? You're going to make it here. And it's, it's a very daunting task to take on early on in your career. Um, but experiment often and Make it easy on yourself. Don't overthink it. Just get started and do a thing and make sure that you're measuring that thing carefully so that you know whether or not it's being successful and you can optimize, right? But get out there and make some, make some content. Go to a couple of events. Try and hold a meetup of your own. I think you will find that it is much less scary once you've done it a couple of times. I like that then. Be fearless. Just go for it. Yeah. And on that note, um, thank you to the four of you. I think this has been a very interesting uh, session. Thank you for sharing your your insights and your openness to to contribute. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you. It was a great yeah. time. Thank you. Great to and meet you, everyone. It was nice to meet you all, and so this is again sometime soon, maybe. And we have like a, a perfect sunset in the background over there. I guess we <laughs> <that. laughs> the sun went down. It's time for us I, to all I go to bed. It. I planned it on purpose. Yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thank bye, you. Friends. Thank you again. And bye, everyone that's been watching. Thank you for staying with us. Bye bye.